For the final session of the day, before we hear from our uh, closing keynotes, um, we're focusing on community. Uh, and it segues nicely from the sort of the previous conversation and talking about kind of the importance of the crowd, the importance of community in terms of supporting business growth. Um, and um, we're going to be hearing from Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Sandlin, who's the founder of Crowd Cafe, a crowdfunding research and resource site. Uh, joining Jonathan will be Scott Rowan from Amex Open Forum, Charlie O'Donnell from Brooklyn Bridge Ventures, uh, journalist Amy Vernon, and also Ron Williams, who is the CEO of Nodes. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to give a brief presentation on the global investment capital industry, specifically investment based, so it's very based debt. Briefly, just to first parse the investment crowdfunding mechanism. So this is reward-based crowdfunding. Who is actually pledging? You have family, friends, customers, and affinities. These are the motivations behind this. Um, so people who want to pre-order the product, people who are aligned with your cause, people who are aligned with your beliefs, and they are giving pledges. The difference, of course, with investment-based is you invite in that investment motivation. And the great thing about crowdfunding is it supports all of these motivations, and every raise is going to look differently. Um, my belief is most raises will look like this. You know, you'll have people who will be investing $100, maybe $500, um, but the large part of the round will be given by investment motivations, people who are looking for that financial return. And of course, you don't always get funded. Um, brief data point, Kickstarter, the average fundraise is $5,000 because you don't have that investment motivation. It's very difficult to raise $100,000 from 1,000 people because people, they don't want free food for a year from that restaurant. However, if you're a restaurant and you're raising investment capital, most people still may only give $100. Um, however, if there's an investor who says, I love the return, I love the return profile of this company, I'll write a $10,000 check. I'll write a $15,000 check. And so that blended approach, Crowdcube is an equity platform in the UK, and their average fundraise size is 100,000. And we'll come back to them. Very briefly on the legalities. When you hear about Title II of the Jobs Act, effectively what that is is crowdfunding for accredited investors, high net worth individuals. That was just passed last week. We will see implementation in the next 60 days or so. And it'll allow companies to advertise, but only accredited investors can participate. Title III, on the other hand, this is truly democratized crowdfunding. This is where everybody can participate. This was, um, in my opinion, of course, the heart of the bill, where we say, okay, regardless wealth, you can invest in the companies you believe in. The accredited crowdfunding impact, um, it's gonna bring dramatic efficiencies to our private capital markets, and really I look at efficiencies as the internet coupled with private sector innovation, geographically and socially indiscriminate. So if you're an angel investor in Zanesville, Ohio, where I'm from, for example, um, you only see deal flow today in Ohio, if you're lucky. Um, tomorrow you'll have access to deal flow regardless geographies. And not only that, it's that much more efficient. So if you're a doctor in Indiana and you want to invest in a private company, you want to invest in a startup, what do you do? You drive 60 miles, maybe to hear a local angel group, and you write a $30,000 check just to get in. And then you go to a meeting once a month. It's very frictional. And for that reason, out of the 8.6 million accredited investors, only 2 to 3 percent, depending on which study you look at, invest in early stage tech startups. 2 to 3 percent. And the reason is it's frictional. The efficiencies post Title II is you log into your computer and you have access to deal flow of all geographies. And so I think we believe that this stands to motivate accredited capital off the sidelines and into the private markets in an enormous way. Or if accredited investors now have frictional access to our private capital markets, will they take advantage of that? And I believe so. The democratized impact, of course, for businesses, the conversion of social to financial capital. If you're a small business and you have a great reputation in your community, um, that's a real asset. It drives repeat business. It drives loyalty. Yet if you go to a bank and you say, can I get a loan against this social capital? Everybody knows me. The bank says, sorry, we can't. We can't lend against an intangible asset. But the community will. The com community will lend against that social capital. If you look at a public company, if they have a great brand, it's very much an asset. It's called goodwill. The new era of marketing, we've talked about customer acquisition uh, many times through crowdfunding. You know, I think it's interesting when I talk to small business owners and I grew up in the small business community, they'll tell you it's not always price that they can't compete on. It's more so consumer share of mind. It's the fact that when I go to buy a toolkit, who do I think of? I think of Sears because they've advertised to me on TV, 
through the newspaper, my local newspaper. So when I go to buy something, they're top of mind. If I'm invested, though, in a local Home Depot or a local hardware store, who's going to be top of mind for me? So I think it's an incredible new era of marketing where small businesses, it gives them a way to fight back. Investors, of course, empowering, investing in a marketplace that they trust and that's meaningful. And the society, equal opportunity. You know, this country is built on providing equal opportunity to people, yet our financial markets exclude. The U.S. market, very briefly, this is uh, three buckets that I sort of break it up in. It's not perfect. There definitely is a crossover. So you have the crowdfunding platforms that are going after startups, that are supporting startups. You have those that are focusing on small businesses, many of them existing. Bolster is a royalty-based model. Somo Lend is debt. Local stake offers uh, debt, equity, and royalty. Um, then you have niche. So Circle Up is focused on one industry vertical. Fundrise is focused on real estate. And then Affinity. You know, will people want to invest in the things that they're passionate about? And absolutely. Solar Mosaic, for instance, is allowing people to invest in solar power. Global crowd, crowdfunding. So what can we learn? Well, the first thing is here's the macro data. Here are six platforms that I track every month that I update. ASOB has done $132 million, 180 deals, equity. Funding Circle is a debt-based platform in the UK. Crowdcube is in the UK. Simbit is in the Netherlands. Cedars is in the UK. And Circle Up, they're in the US. They're not advertising, but they are doing deals. They're facilitating transactions entirely online. And what to take away from this, $300 million plus in transactions, over 289 equity placements. And these are just the platforms I've tracked. These are not all of them. Over 2,200 loans, zero instances of fraud, zero. And so a lot of people talk about fraud, and it should be talked about, but we should understand that where does fraud take place? It doesn't take place in rooms like this where information is transparent. I'm not going to defraud you guys because the second I tell you I want to build a rocket ship, you look at my LinkedIn and you see I'm not an engineer. Fraud takes place in the shadows. Crowdfunding is the most transparent marketplace there is. And so that's it's largely self-regulating. And then you see innovation from platforms saying our existence as a crowdfunding platform is hinged upon creating a trustworthy marketplace. So they do everything they can. Different models. Funding Circle is a debt-based model. It allows businesses with two years of operations in the UK to raise debt capital. They offer one, three, five-year loans up to one million pounds. They started by offering up to 250K, and then up to 500, now up to one million. They also have a secondary market. They, crowd, they crowdfunded two 80,000 pound small business loans in under 29 minutes. I mean, that, that's amazing. The, the efficiency that they are able to bring to the marketplace is incredible. You can discover companies, you can look at their profiles, their credit score history, their financials, you can ask Q&A. And then this is their funding to date. They funded $12 million last month in small business loans. So there's a real opportunity cost and they allow all investors to participate. You can invest as little as 20 pounds in a small business. There's an opportunity cost to us not getting this right. Our small businesses are not getting the access to capital that they need. Crowdcube is an equity crowdfunding platform Sector focus is a pretty generalist. They're raising capital for startups and existing small businesses. To date, that I've tracked 48 raises. They've done 58, but I managed to get 48. Their average raise is 124,000, average equity offered. And their average number of investors is 52. Um, that puts an investment size around 2,700. So it's pretty high. And if you look at their per investor size, you see exactly what I described before. You see a lot of people investing 100 pounds. However, you also see an angel investing 20,000 pounds. And so it's that mix of where you have accredited investors or high net worth individuals able to invest much more, but you're also including everybody else. Cedars focuses on pre-revenue idea stage startups. These are the riskiest companies. Um, the idea is they want to allow you to create a highly diverse portfolio of high risk startups. Um, they've done around 24 raises to date. You can see that their average post money valuation is lower, as is their average investment size. It's 1000 Their minimum investment size is $16. $16. You know, if, if I'm a parent, which I hope to be one day, I'm taking my kid out every month. And I'm saying, hey, let's look at 10 startups. Let's invest in two. $30. You know, it, it's not just about the investment. You know, I grew up in Ohio. I didn't really, I started my first website when I was 13, but I didn't know what a startup was. I didn't have the exposure. Imagine being able to go to kids on TV and say, hey, you can get involved with the innovation economy. You don't need to be in New York City or San Francisco. You can be anywhere. This, this allows you to get involved. It creates this participatory environment. 
Circle up is for accredited investors only today. <coughs> But they prove one thing and that how efficient this process is. They're raising capital for existing consumer product and retail companies. Most of them are over $2 million in revenue. They're filling this capital gap where these companies are not sexy enough for venture capital, but they're not big enough for private equity. And this is actually a funding gap that exists in many in industries. Um, and they leverage their domain expertise. So Ryan Callback, the CEO, comes from TSG Consumer Partners, comes from a private equity background. So they only accept 2% of applications. For investors, this is great. They're getting quali high quality deal flow very efficiently. Uh, just 1.3 weeks of time, the time it took to raise a million dollars for a company. Um, I was a former investment banker, and that should scare the hell out of every investment banker. Three weeks from beginning to end raising a million dollars for a company. Um, the efficiencies uh, are incredible. The disruption, so is this disruptive? And I know this, this is a belabored word and, and, and overused, but uh, it really is disruptive. And, and I view it as the intersection of two types of disruption. So there's the technical disruption, and this is what you hear about most often. This is simply the entrance of the internet into our private capital markets for the first time in history. You've seen the internet disrupt every other industry because it creates efficiencies. It pushes out old systems. That's only the first part, though. There's also a social disruption and, and cultural disruption. And this is something that you know, I think has, has a far larger impact long term. So. An example of the technical disruption, Funding Circle, the debt platform we talked about, their average duration of getting a business on their platform to getting it funded, raising, is 12 days. If you go to a big bank in the UK, it's six to 12 weeks. It's just a fundamentally more efficient capital formation process. That's the technical disruption. You don't have the overhead, you don't have the expensive bankers, you don't have all of those things to raise capital where you're an internet platform. That's the technical side. But it's also cultural. And the cultural is very much, there's this new age of consumer where they want more meaning in the things they do, they want more meaning in the things they buy, and next they are going to want more meaning in the things they invest in. Today, distrust is pervasive in our stock market. This is from Chicago Booth. It shows that 13% of Americans trust the stock market. I think this is up to 15% this past month. Still, fewer than one in five Americans trust the stock market. That's a failure of the marketplace. If one in five people trusted eBay, it would fail tomorrow. However, the reason it doesn't adapt, the reason it doesn't change, is because there's no alternative. Where, where else can we go? We can't go anywhere else. Crowdfunding gives us that opportunity. It gives us that alternative. It says you can invest in a marketplace that you actually trust. And so, what I think it really boils down to is if you ask the question, if given the opportunity, will a new generation, will the existing generation, will investors want to invest in the companies they believe in, the companies they drive by every day, the startups they read about? If even in a small way, one, three, five percent of their portfolio, will they? And I believe they will. And if the answer to that is right, then we're going to see an incredible innovation in our private markets. And it's really part of this meaningful web where we want more meaning in the things we do. And, and so with that, I thank you. The presentation is available at uh, thecrowdcafe.com slash crowdfundx. And uh, would love to get into a panel around community and looking specifically sort of at the social side where people are investing in things they care about and creating stronger communities through the capital markets. So Scott is the Vice President of Digital Marketing and Innovation at Amex. And as many of you probably know, they've, cre they've created an incredible online and offline community through Amex Open. Um, and they've also done quite a bit of crowdfunding. So Scott, I would love if you talk about the crowdfunding initiative. <laughs> well, so first of all, I, just backing up, um, <clears throat> I work within a business unit dedicated to small business owners. Uh, we have been in business for over 25 years, the company, of course, over 163 years, but we've been focused on small business and entrepreneurs uh, for 25 years. We have over 1,000 employees dedicated to this. And when we look at it, we think, one, it's an important business for us, but it's really the driver of this economy. Small businesses create two-thirds of the jobs in this country and about half of our GDP. So when we look at something like crowdfunding, it looks like an opportunity for us to accelerate this movement to drive not only, of course, a business forward, but our economy and the, the, the local communities. 
As far as our role specifically, uh, we, we've been uh, creating content and community around the information about what uh, crowdfunding is now for quite some time on Open Forum. But more recently, we've been trying to help uh, young aspiring entrepreneurs take advantage of this. Just last month, we were working with Venture for America uh, and uh, a couple dozen of their, their fellows to create businesses funded by a crowdfunding platform. And so we work very closely with them to take their ideas, package them, and help them get the funding they needed. And just closed a few weeks ago, and, and there are eight new businesses that have been created out of that. It's amazing. And, and you talk about the role of growing small businesses and their access to capital becoming, from traditional sources, is, is declining. Um, and largely, it's structural, where large banks, even if they want to lend, oftentimes they can't. Um, and I know you also talked about, you sort of, with your work, you broke it into four areas, focusing on community and its people, content, conversations, and event. And could you sort of delineate on that framework and the importance and context of crowdfunding? Um, yeah, so we've learned a lot and we're continuing to learn on how to, how to help business owners and entrepreneurs be more successful. Uh, a, as an example, uh, we created something called Small Business Saturday which is a day where we've dedicated between Black Friday right after Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday. And the whole idea was to inspire consumers to go out and shop locally, shop small. And last year we had over 100 million people go out and shop locally on that single day. And so when we sat down with, for example, the Venture for America Fellows and many other businesses online and offline, we tried to understand what got us from zero just a few years ago to 100 million people. And so much of it is effectively using the community. So a lot of this is obvious, but when, we, when you dissect it, it really just boils down to those four components, or at least those are very important ones. So on the people front, people just assume that these crowds emerge, but they don't. You know, you, you actually have to invest a good amount of time and effort and thought into creating that initial movement. Uh, there's a great TED talk on the first follower. If anyone hasn't seen it, I highly, highly recommend just Googling first follower TED. And the whole talk is about how a movement starts. It's pretty funny, but it's also quite uh, informative. So th getting the people right is important. Content fuels the conversation. So getting some content out there, there was a lot of discussion earlier about creating that story about what that, you know, how much time to invest there, or money, and that's critical. I would absolutely look to spend time and money in creating that story, creating that content. And then the third piece of it, conversation, is what fuels people along. Uh, crowdfunding platforms en enable this, but let people participate. They, they, that's how you build this community and, get, and move it forward. But I think the most interesting one for me was the event. And we had a lot of discussion internally uh, for Small Business Saturday. It was a, it's a big deal for us. And we want every day to be Small Business Saturday. We want people to go out and support local businesses, small businesses in their community every single day. Um, but there's something about creating an event where you can rally the troops and get people to come together and feel like they're participating in something very specific that creates that community, creates that climax, creates that turning point in the story that people get excited about. And so as, as we try to convey what we've learned, those are the four things that we spend a lot of time on. The people, the content, the conversation, and an event that can really rally it. And this can be cyclical where you go over and over and continue to build up. Yeah, 100 million people. And, and so I think that's very much validating that people, they want to be engaged with their community. They just need the access and the means to do so. And so you guys have created this distribution. What do you see with people want to do it, they just need the means to do so? Does Amex, do they have any plans? Or, or what are your thoughts around supporting this and supporting local investing? Uh, I, so there, there's no question. This is, some, as I mentioned, we, we've been very focused on this for over 25 years. And as new innovation comes available, we're always looking to figure out how we can leverage it to support uh, local businesses, small businesses. Um, and I think crowdfunding is another example. Uh, a lot of people don't have access. Uh, we have a number of products and services. Last quarter, we provided over $30 billion worth of capital to small businesses to be able to buy the goods and services to run their business. But that isn't to say that there aren't 
other opportunities for people to access that capital in, in new means. And so that's what's interesting for us, for how can we help people tap into this new space so that they can create their business and, cr and grow it in a way that works for them. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And, and with that, I'd like to invite Amy Vernon up. And Amy is the general manager at Internet Media Labs and also founder of Amy Vernon LLC. And, and she has helped build technology platforms that allow publications to meaningfully connect with users uh, as well focuses on new media strategies. So Amy, I'd love to, to hear more about your work um, and tell us the importance of building the community before the need is actually there. Sure. Um, if you think about it, if you build a community um, when you need it, you're, you're coming from, from a, a point of, of what can you do for me instead of what, what can I do for you. And really the way to build a successful community is to really learn who you're, you know, we heard a lot of people this morning talking about uh, just in terms of, of pitching, like who your audience is. And it's the same thing with commu your community. You have to figure out who your audience is, who, who you want in your community. It's great to have, you know, 100,000 people, but if only 40 of them are actually relevant to your message and what you're about, your 100,000 people are, are useless. So you want to really find who your, your audience is and find them and start talking to them. And you end up making your own publication or product or whatever it is uh, more relevant to them by learning more about them as time goes on. Absolutely. And you also talk, so you, so you get the community. So context of crowdfunding, you raise the funds and you have 300 backers. How do you continue to engage them afterwards and what's the importance of that? It's, it's really important, I think, that uh, especially through the process for the people who, who really came on early on and for people who are potentially coming on later on to be constantly updating and letting people know what's going on. Even if there's not a lot of news, even if it's just to say, you know, hey, I know it's been you know, a week since I said anything, you know, we're still plugging away at this. Because people want to know, and if someone comes in, you know, say, say you know, you're on one of the crowdfunding platforms and you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and someone comes on and they heard about your project and they think it's interesting, and there's no updates, they don't really have any sense of, of what you're about or, or who you are. You, you, and the people who are there, they're wondering what's going on. They, they want to know. They've, they've pledged, whether it's $1 or $2,500. Uh, to, to help you achieve your goal. And they're going to feel happier about it uh, and more comfortable with it and be more engaged with you in the long run if you're, if you're talking to them. And um, for example, uh, I, some people here might be familiar with fake Grimlock. He's a, a pretend robot dinosaur who gives startup advice. Anyway, um, he has a book coming out. He's really funny. There's like three people in the world who know who he actually is in person, and I'm not one of them, and I really want to know. Um, and, uh, but I've actually talked to him offline in semi-robot voice. Uh, and and, uh, <laughs> and, and he's, he's really, he did a Kickstarter for a book. And it was one of the things that really struck me right there was like every week there were updates. He was saying where things were. I got this chapter done. There are these new rewards. And I, I really thought it was a great textbook example of how to do a crowdfunding campaign. You know, maybe not, I mean, he had a tremendous number of updates. And not everybody necessarily is, I mean, his business is communicating. So obviously that's what he does. But Everybody knew where things were, and and when it was when it was over, and he raised the funds, and he kept us updated on like when things were shipping, and it just everybody everybody loved it. Everybody read the updates. Everybody went and stayed engaged and shared the information. Like, oh, I'm really excited. I'm going to get my fake Grimlock. But people were sharing it because they were getting excited because of the feedback that they were getting back. Not everybody can be a fake robot dinosaur, though. Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> Actually, it was funny because I was at a, was at a conference elsewhere, and somebody had mentioned, "Oh man, look at this guy! He just raised 100k um, for his book. Like that's incredible! Like this is the future of the industry." Um, however, he spent two years building his community, literally. I mean, he's been online every single blog, every single day, building that community. So it's it's not a you know free for all. Right. It's, you well, really have to have the social capital. And and in the case of Fake Grimlock, I mean, he's been around. He started out. 
um, commenting on uh, Fred Wilson's blog, and um, he's actually guest posted on on Fred's blog before, and he has he started a Twitter chat with um, I think it was with Laura Fitton from HubSpot um, Beyond Fire, and they ran that chat together for like a year. And so he's been out there and he built a big community who he was able to then, when he launched his project, he sent an email blast out to this community he had built and who, whose emails he had by their permission. And, uh, and even the people whose emails he didn't have by tweeting about it or, or you know, contacting them in other ways, they, at the very least, they were going to look at the project because he spent a tremendous amount of time really building a great community who just you know, loved what he was doing. Continuing to engage him, absolutely. I'd like to invite Ron Williams up. Ron is the uh, CEO of Nodes, and they're building a technology platform to facilitate community action, interaction um, and very, very data-driven. Uh, so Ron, I'd love to tell, you, tell us more about what you do. Cool, um, good to be here. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I literally got, I was like emailing and then you're like, Ron's coming up. Um, so Nodes is a platform that's focused on, it's actually really great and refreshing for me to hear uh, people that are more experienced than I am talking about what's needed uh, to drive validation. We focus on looking at all the signals that exist out in the social web. Who in my network actually be engaged in this particular kind of campaign based upon two fundamental elements. What's the nature of our relationship and what have they talked about, posted about, engaged in previously that would let me know that these are the right people for me to ask. Um, we're big believers that um, when we talk about amassing social capital, there's what I call the digital sort of 1%. There are people certainly who are wealthy when it comes to social capital. And then there's, for the most part, the rest of us. And you know, many of you guys have, I'm sure, better cloud scores than I do. Um, what do you do for those people? That, that the sort of majority of the web is comprised of folks who don't have 500,000 followers um, like Fred Wilson. Um, who, by the way, even with 500,000 followers, still isn't one of the top 1,000 or 1,500 accounts on Twitter. So the web is largely made up of people who don't necessarily have the kinds of followings that um, some of these bigger web personalities have. How do you empower them to reach out to their networks intelligently? How do you empower them to help their supporters reach out to their networks intelligently? And so we're looking at uh, social media and sort of web interaction from that perspective. How do we leverage data to better parse people's networks and connections into things that are more usable to them, uh, more approachable. Don't just post on Facebook, hey guys, back me. Here are the 10 people you should be specifically asking for this kind of project. And then show those people who they should specifically be asking about this kind of project. So yeah. that's what we focus on. I'd say in the top-down approach, you know, saying, okay, the cloud score, it doesn't work for everyone. Because right. if there is a small business owner, a tremendous social capital, but he's built it largely offline, how do you measure that and how do you help them catalyze that? What, what interesting insights have you guys found in terms of ways that you can do that um, in sort of unconventional ways for people who, who haven't amassed that digital trail? Well, you know, the first, the first kind of organizing principle is people love you for different reasons. Um, so there's a good friend of ours, a guy named Barton Day Thurston, who's uh, actually on the cover of Fast Company this month. Um, and when he was about to launch his book, uh, his book is called How to Be Black, um, as he was preparing to launch his book, I, saw, I heard some, some, some chuckles there. It actually is called that, by the way. It's not gonna do what you think, but um, so, while he was preparing to launch his book, the question was, how should he spend his time? And he was using an early version of our product to search his 130,000 person following on Twitter, and I couldn't figure out why he was melting our servers. And it turned out that when we sat down to talk with him, what he was doing was he was parsing his connected community into the specific sort of verticals, very segmented verticals of, here are the people that love me because I used to be the web editor of The Onion. Here are the people that love me because I'm a black comic. Here are the people who love me because of uh, my political sort of commentary, uh, and here the people love me because I was on Discovery or whatever. And it was this novel approach to hyper-targeting within your existing network. It doesn't have to be one message for all anymore. Your ask doesn't have to be, even if all you have is 100 friends, hey guys, support me. If you're doing a project about Viking music, there are going to be some of your friends that like Vikings, some of your friends that like music, some of your friends that like both, and some of your friends who don't care. And so how can you actually better activate your network is, yeah. is what we, so we, and we wound up working with him to help him prepare his launch. Yeah, it seems like the only thing that's, that hasn't been commoditized is, is our attention. And so, but it's very short now where we may give you five seconds. And so if it's not relevant in that first five seconds, I'm probably going to turn it off. So saying, hey, I'm going to parse this and every message I have is going to be relevant to the person reading it and really amplify uh, the feedback. Well, fantastic. So lastly, I'd like to bring on stage Charlie O'Donnell. 
And Charlie O'Donnell is a partner at Brooklyn Bridge Ventures, which is a VC fund here in the community, obviously. Um, and so Charlie, I'd love to tell, you, tell us more about what you do and, and, and particularly how, you know, obviously it's in your name. Your, your, your name is, is focused on the community and how you're investing in the community and the role that that affinity plays, you know, being in New York and, and being in Brooklyn um, affects how you invest in, in your relationship with the founders. Sure. Um, it's kind of easy to build community when you give money away for a living. Should I just shout? It's working? Okay. Now I don't think so. All right. Well, um, I think in a place like New York, there's really no shortage of money. I mean, that's never really been the problem. Any look up and down the rooftops on Park Avenue, you know, at, at 10 or $20 million a pop, there's uh, plenty of people with money going around that don't know how to spend it. Um, I think what community does is it represents uh, a sort of signaling and a, and a filtering for, you know, who do I actually want to work with? And reputation really counts a lot. Um, and so, you know, there are you sometimes a first time entrepreneur will come in and say, well, you know, can I sign an NDA or this is private or, or whatever? And I, and I say, yeah, I, I have to protect your confidentiality because if I didn't, you'd, you would have heard about it already. Yeah. Right. And, and the community is so closely connected that um, good stuff that you do for people comes back to you and ways that you uh, mistreat folks. And I've, I've seen in rounds that get raised, uh, VCs being overly harsh on terms or just kind of being overall a, a pain in the neck. And, and I sit there and go, these people are never gonna get deal flow after this because this entrepreneur is gonna tell their friend and their friend and their friend, oh, by the way, don't, don't go to these guys because they're gonna waste your time. And so community reputation is really, really important for both uh, our ability to to vet companies and their ability to vet us. Can you talk about, so where I'm an entrepreneur and you know there's this maybe big global VC, sort of this faceless VC and maybe the most reputable, yet there's Brooklyn Ventures who's in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Do I feel like you know, is tied to this community and dedicated? And can you give some examples of how that has worked to your benefit and seeing? Yeah, two of the companies are in the building next door to me. Uh, so I don't know if it was because of my reputation for intelligence or the fact that I'm geographically the closest VC <laughs> to them, and it was just really easy. Um, and I, I bump into one of my entrepreneurs every time I go to yoga. We have the same, uh, uh, same schedule. But um, yeah, I, I don't think you can be a VC and be faceless anymore. Um, you know, I, I was, I've been fortunate enough to work for two of the best uh, investors in New York and uh, Union Square Ventures and, and First Round Capital. And so when I was at Union Square in, in 05, we turned our brochureware homepage into a blog. And this, this wasn't like, you know, there's one partner who blogs and all the rest of it. It was like our homepage. And, and that really, I think, kind of was the tipping point in terms of uh, the kinds of interactions that investors had with the community. Um, it's really tough to, um, you, you can scale in terms of reputation, but you can't really scale in terms of um, engagement, right? So you can write the most popular blog, but you can't pay attention to 500,000 followers all at once. Right, and so you know, uh, there, there starts to build like smaller and smaller communities around you that can have different levels of engagement. So whereas my community might be the uh, handful of people that I bump into on a regular basis on J Street and Dumbo, and then you know outside of that, you know, a Brooklyn, and then slightly larger than that, the rest of the city, and then you know Twitter following, which is you know, and then you know, weekly newsletter or whatever, somebody who works at a much bigger firm, uh, you know, their, uh, their network is extending much, much further, right? You know, Dave McClure probably knows somebody in every country, but obviously there's, you know, the one-on-one -on -one interactions and all that sort of stuff, that's just harder to scale. Yeah, and I think Chance Burnett mentioned earlier uh, about the emotional brain versus the rational. We make decisions emotionally, and you know, they say that, <coughs> business happens on the golf course. It has nothing to do with the golf course. As a fact, 
everything to do with the fact that we're there with the person developing this human relationship. And so when we go to make a decision, we want to work with somebody we trust. And being local, being able to grab a cup of coffee, uh, is infinitely more powerful than me reading a blog. And I, I think one of the other things too is the reality is that 80% of the due diligence work that I do on you is done before I even take the meeting. That's for me as a local investor because I know the networks that you've come from. I mean, entrepreneurs don't really just kind of fall out of the sky here in New York. I mean, you you have worked for somebody before. Uh, your, your background is accessible. I can ask, I'm probably one or two degrees away from people you've worked with previously. So for example, there's a, a company uh, that I backed uh, where one of the founders um, was a, uh, worked at Studio Mates, which is uh, Tina Eisenberg's space in, in Dumbo. She's Swiss Miss for all of you who follow her design blog. When that entrepreneur, who literally came in with essentially a PowerPoint, said, I'm going to build this really well-designed application, automatically I know that he can do that because I know that he knows the designers that are capable of doing that, and he has the ability to vet good design versus bad design, and they are willing to work with him because that is a curated community. Whereas if two random people who work for a bank come in and said, well, you know, the kids like iPads, so we're gonna design a really good iPad app. Like, you don't know who the designers are to hire, nor would they work for you. So I have to do a lot more due diligence work on your ability to get that done versus somebody who has a very localized community reputation that, that I just know based on where you came from, like that you're able to do something. Well, with that, I think if we have enough time to open it up to a few questions. Talking about the investor communication, so I was uh, very interested in your, uh, in your remarks. Um, in this kind of brave new world, When you say something, what you say, you know, is very highly regulated. You know, God, you know, if you if you screw up, you're going to have the SEC on you all the time. Private uh, companies are looser, but investors kind of like to know. You know, they're trying to like to get a quarterly report. You know, what's it? You know, what's going on? Uh, even if your financials are unaudited, they'd like to see them. Um, when we get into this, uh, the, this you know, sort of community-based conversation kind of stuff, um, I, as a lawyer, I see you know dozens of potential problems. One of them being non-uniform, what's called in the business selective disclosure, where you know you don't say the same thing to everybody at the same time. Um, what you promise them that you're going to say is very, very really like your approach of, you know, often and early, um, but uh, I, I just want to caution all the entrepreneurs here that uh, this is a really very key component of what your life is going to be like once you take on all these investments. Well, I, I think uh, to, to address that is, you know, when you're an individual entrepreneur, obviously, you know, you know what your message is and, and you have to figure out how you're going to properly express that as you, as you grow and there's more people involved you do need to make sure that everybody is on the same page and that you're, um, and that everybody knows what message um, needs to be communicated. So if you have server downtime or something, that the people who are actually doing the communication know um, what to say, even if they can't say everything will be back tomorrow, they know, they know the basics so that they, they can provide good information. So it's, it's it, it does become a little more complicated the larger you get because you have more people and everybody has different voices, but you have to figure out as a company what your voice is and how you, how you communicate with your audience. I also think to jump in there, there are companies that are starting to replicate the sort of the analogs to what you would have offline in traditional capital markets and fundraising. So every piece of that process I think is going to be replicated in a technology enabled way. Due diligence reporting, all this stuff I think is going to take a new form, but I think you're right, it's, it's, it's going to have to become 
core to how you raise money in this new way? Yeah, absolutely. So the two, the two leading equity platforms in the UK, one is Crowdcube. They allow investors to directly invest. The other is Cedars. And Cedars, they're doing a thing that a lot of platforms here in the US would do um, in that they are the sponsor of the deal. They're the only entity on the cap table. And they structure investor relations. They handle all of that, of course, for a fee. That's part of their business model. And I think, so we'll see platforms play a very active role because you make a great point. You need to have synchronicity um, and outlines. Um, real quick, obviously, you guys have you know, worked with 25 million small businesses. And, and, and how do you get a consistent message out to them? And do you have any examples of sort of how you've built that distribution and how you continue to engage them? Well, so. You know, I think there's a difference between the marketing message to get out there versus, to, to your point, once you get into um, the equity side. Right, so, um, so we, we deal with both. And um, you know, as a uh, regulated industry, there are terms and conditions and so forth that we need to get out to everyone. And it takes a lot of operational excellence to make that happen. Um, on the other side of it, just building it, we have 3.8 million fans and followers just within my business alone. And being able to leverage those to get the communications out, those aren't financial communications, but to help build the community, we're, we're balancing both ends of the spectrum. Okay, with that, uh, let's thank all of our speakers in our last session.